Uh, I've got 10 minutes to talk about what's new, so I'll just begin with uh, kind of an apology. I'm going to try and go through a lot of data uh, quickly. Uh, my disclosures, uh, so what is new? A lot of data on imaging, limitations of the MRI, which we thought was going to be the GPS for the prostate. It is to, only to a degree. New modalities coming down the pipe. A lot on biomarkers, the limitations of existing ones, the promise of new ones. Deeper understanding of the genomics of low versus higher grade disease. And the tumor microenvironment, I'll touch on that briefly. And many overviews and meta-analyses addressing current controversies, outcome in the post-MRI era and men on surveillance, uh, the role of surveillance in favorable intermediate risk disease, impact of race, family history, what about very young patients, are they candidates, the requirement for systematic biopsy in the era of targeted biopsy. We have population-based data on the increased utilization of active surveillance, and at every one of these meetings, Dr. Crawford has given me a hard time about we got to get moved beyond surveillance, got to die. But I'm sorry, Dave, it continues, the utilization continues to increase. And positioning of surveillance vis a vis focal therapy is another hot topic. So, just briefly, what we know about the molecular genetics that about 90% of Gleason 3 has normal molecular genetics. If there's a, a tumor suppressor gene that P10, like P10 that's lost in higher grade cancer, it's present in Gleason 3 and so on. This means the metastatic potential is zero. This is, I think, a very uh, solid statement, uh, not universally accepted, but it should be. And it means you don't need to treat patients for higher volume Gleason 3 because it is not going to metastasize ever. There's virtually no cases in the world of this where it's proven uh, with surgical pathology from radical prostatectomy that there's no higher grade cancer that then goes on to metastasize. It can invade locally. As many of you may be aware, there's a controversy over whether it sh still should be called cancer. Uh, my view is that because of the invasive uh, quality, which is in about 3% of cases only, but not zero, uh, it does qualify as cancer. So this is from UCSF a heat map of the genetic aberrancy, a so-called average genomic risk or metascore of genetic aberrancy. And you can see the second line is the Gleason score. It goes from kind of light blue at the favorable genomics to dark blue, but it's not absolutely discrete. There's a few light blue lines over here. And the data was that 2% of grade group 1 are in the highest average genomic risk quartile, meaning really bad genetics. My guess is those are the cases that tomorrow are actually going to be higher grade cancer. They're in the process of de-differentiating. You just don't see it yet on the biopsy. And uh, noteworthy that as soon as there's any pattern four present, you have seven times the, a greater risk of being in the highest AGR quartile. So just briefly, a comparison of some of the recent data out there. There's a range of indications and eligibility. The two extremes were Hopkins and us. We included 3 plus 4. We didn't get hung up on PSA. They were very stringent, just Epstein criteria. And this is a summary of the results now. And just in the last year or two, there's been some more mature and larger series. It's remarkable the treatment-free survival is in a fairly narrow range, somewhere around 60 percent at five years and almost the same at 10 years. Most patients who are treated are treated in the first five years. Cancer-specific mortality remarkably low. We're not going to improve much on mortality as we refine this approach, but we are going to improve on patient selection and who requires treatment. So just some of this uh, recent data. This is from the Hopkins group now, over 1,800 patients. Cancer-specific mortality, 0.1 percent in 10 and 15 years. So this is the value of a restricted approach to surveillance. If you only include patients with Epstein criteria, you basically don't have any de uh, deaths. Of course, many of the patients are treated and, and reclassified. The rate was about a third of patients at 15 years. Um, and this just shows that, as, as you'd expect, uh, about two, about uh, of the patients who were upgraded, about two thirds to grade group two or higher, and about 10 percent to uh, of the whole cohort to grade group three or higher. Uh, this is from Peter's group, 1,450 patients, median follow-up 6.5 years, but a lot of these patients have been followed 
lot longer than that. 1% metastasis rate, so 10 times the Hopkins rate, but still very low. Uh, most of these were lymph node metastasis, and importantly, the predictors for progression for biologic grade uh, upgrading, grade group 2 PSA velocity, which looks quite powerful, and uh, a positive MRI. And you can see, you know, the metastasis rate, you have to look very hard to see anything happening there. Uh, this is PSA, patients with PSA density less than 0.15, and it gave them the same risk for uh, progression as uh, having a Gleason 4 pattern present at the time of diagnosis, so it's quite powerful. This is from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Sigrid Carlson, and the main thing I want to point out here, this is in uh, 2664, uh, sorry, t almost 3,000 patients, mostly grade group 1, five with metastases, so really remarkable. Just want to point out the curve of upgrading and the curve of treatment are superimposable. In other words, the only indication for upgrading in this cohort was grade progression. So you're going to leave aside PSA velocity, uh, leave aside volume progression, uh, it's grade progression. Uh, what about young patients? The key point here is that younger patients have a lower risk of high-grade cancer. And uh, what it means, this, this just showed that with age, the likelihood of grade progression increased. But it's very reassuring that younger patients are much less likely to harbor higher-grade cancer. As you get older, of course, you have two competing forces, the inc increased risk of high-grade cancer but the decreased risk of cancer mortality due to intercurrent uh, illness and comorbidity. Uh, we published this series with the group at Harvard. Adam Feldman was the main collaborator in more than 400 patients under the age of 60 because one of the issues has always been, you know, these young patients, don't they have more aggressive disease? And they cer there's certainly not a shred of evidence that they do. Their outcome in terms of uh, requiring treatment is exactly the same as the older patients. There's no evidence that in these young patients they have more aggressive disease. Uh, family history is a systematic review published recently of the impact of family history on the likelihood of progression defined as upgrading, and it had no impact. So with the exception of uh, BRCA mutations, which is another story, the, the mere fact of a family history at this point doesn't mean the patient is at increased risk for more aggressive disease. With uh, black race, uh, the story's a little different. It's been known for years that they have a higher rate of um, harboring higher grade cancer. Uh, more like uh, 40 to 50 percent versus around 30 percent for of the overall population, but despite that, if they are managed appropriately with surveillance, intervention for upgrading, no difference in the rate of metastasis or mortality. So this is also, I would say, somewhat reassuring. You have to be on top of these patients, but their risk is no greater. Uh, I mentioned briefly the germline mutation story. Uh, we just heard something about that in Larry Karsh's talk. And just to say that I think based on, at the moment, in particularly patients with BRCA2, this is, there's two studies out there that have looked at this in men on surveillance. This is from Hopkins. They had 26 men with one of several DNA repair mutations. And uh, with BRCA2, almost a threefold greater risk of progression to higher grade cancer. It's 80% at, at 10 years. I think the real figure is more like 100%, and they were missed in 20%. So I think there's a consensus now, not universal, that particularly BRCA2 patients uh, with low grade cancer should actually be treated radically, in most cases with surgery, may change tomorrow. But that's the consensus today. And just, just to emphasize the controversy, here's an Israeli paper that actually didn't show uh, a considerably worse outcome in men with uh, uh, BRCA defects. So I, I think the jury's still out on this. We need more data. Uh, this is the limitations of MRI. It misses a lot of cancers. Uh, 
MR, we, we hope that you could rely on MRI and men on surveillance to identify the ones who are progressing. It doesn't appear to be the case. This just shows the range of patients. Here's one where you do have progression. Here's one where the MRI was stable despite the fact that there was progression. It's kind of all over the map. This is the data from Sloan Kettering showing really quite disappointingly that the correlation between the MRI progression and grade progression in men on surveillance was quite poor. Overall, about a third of men with stable MRI uh, upgraded, despite the fact there was no change on the MRI. And this comes from the Canary Collaboration, which is a West Coast uh, multi-center group studying men on surveillance to show that actually the MRI did not contribute significantly to the identification of higher grade cancer. Uh, kind of shocking actually, and just to emphasize that whether the MRI is negative or positive in these patients, you still need to do uh, systematic biopsies as well. I think there's a role there for risk stratification, but that's the consensus. And I'm just going to skip through this in the interests of time. This, this is an, a recent overview just published that put all the studies together that looked at uh, the, the uh, sensitivity and specificity of MRI in men on surveillance. You see here for the likelihood of detecting progression, a sensitivity of about 0.6 and specificity 0.75. So there's still room for improvement there. However, a negative MRI confers a lower risk of grade progression over time. Um, this study showed that the risk reduced about 50% in men whose MRI was negative. So I'm not it, it's a powerful tool. It's been a game changer, but it has limitations. Uh, one more study of intermediate risk, which showed somewhat counterintuitively that these patients basically did the same on surveillance. They were, of course, selected, uh, but that the intermediate risk patients managed appropriately, had a lower rate of intervention, no difference in the rates of metastasis. So this just, I think, reinforces uh, the idea, which is controversial, but I think uh, that, that surveillance is an option for many patients with intermediate risk disease. And this, this was a, a Russian meta-analysis that showed, not surprisingly, a higher rate of intervention. This is low grade, high grade, low grade on the left, high grade on the right. Higher rate of intervention uh, initially, but then it stabilized, no difference at 10 or 15 years. And this shows the impact on metastasis-free survival, cause-specific mortality. Obviously, the presence of Gleason-4, which is real cancer, has all the molecular characteristics of cancer, confers a higher rate of disease mortality. Um, we looked at compliance. So uh, just we wondered whether it mattered if patients in our program complied with the, particularly the biopsy, and it did matter. And the patients who complied had better uh, cause-specific survival, metastasis-free survival, and even a trend to overall survival. So you do need to follow these patients. It is important. Finally, something we've learned about the tumor microenvironment, which I think is very fascinating, and that is how obesity works to uh, exacerbate um, progression in men with prostate cancer. So this is a really fascinating recent New England Journal uh, paper, which I'd highly recommend. And it looked at how obesity was influencing the tumor microenvironment. And it does this by altering what's called fatty acid partitioning. So the tumor cells take up free fatty acids and they starve the immunologic cells in that region of fatty acids and impairs their function. So this is, I think, for the first time, shows how obesity can influence cancer progression. It's mediated by something called prolohydroxylase 3 and um, blocks the uh, anti-tumor immunity that would normally be present in these patients. And just some data showing that periprostatic fat volume is associated with increased rate of grade progression. So they have both preclinical and clinical. Uh, Mark Moy had talked about the meal study. And then finally, just to show, I think it's quite gratifying, there's still a lot of variation in the use of surveillance for low-risk prostate cancer, but it's the blue line 
is the rate of uptake. So this goes from 2010 to a few years ago, and you can see everywhere in the country there's uh, increased uptake, uh, about 50 percent overall. So there's, I think, still room for further growth in this area, uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much.